pride, greed, wrath, envy, lust, gluttony, and sloth. The seven capital vices or seven deadly sins. Succumb to any of these sins, and you may find yourself in your very own version of the Divine Comedy, being guided through hell and having the displeasure of climbing out through Satan's nutsack. Or maybe not. Who knows? I'm no expert. It's likely you've heard of the seven deadly sins in some capacity. When we discussed Peter Binsfeld's classification of demons, each one of the seven princes of hell represented one of the seven deadly sins. This became a fairly common way for historians and demonologists to personify and create a taboo around these ideas. Today we'll take a look at what these sins actually meant and why they were so deadly. Before we proceed any further, I must tell you about the undiscovered deadly sin I came across when researching this video. The passage says, He or she who does not know of displate will bear the curse of never knowing the wonders of beautiful magnet-mounted metal canvases. Luckily this isn't something we have to concern ourselves with, because today's video is sponsored by displate. A displate is a metal poster or canvas that makes for a great display piece. With over 1.4 million artists and partnerships with huge brands such as Marvel, DC and Star Wars, I'm sure you'll be able to find something that suits your taste. As you can see, the awesome people over at Displate have sent me some designs I requested. We have everyone's favourite Italian plumber looking creepy as ever, a vibrant space piece, and of course Lovecraft and Cthulhu looking almost as creepy as our plumber. When these arrived I thought I was going to have to start drilling holes and making a mess everywhere, but mounting these canvases is as simple as sticking a pair of magnets to your wall which then secure your canvas in place. Not only is it extremely easy to mount your displate, but if you decide you want a new design, you can simply pull it straight off the magnets and attach a new one in its place. If you'd like to browse the rest of Displate's collection, you can save up to 37% of your order by using the link in the description. Although the Seven Deadly Sins are largely a Christian concept, we do have similar ideas from the ancient Greeks and Romans, as well as many other religions across the world. It's common for the seven deadly sins to be paired with the seven holy virtues, because they are examples of how we should and should not behave. Aristotle saw this as less of a concrete right and wrong system, and more as a spectrum of behaviour. If one veers too far off in any direction, we move into vice territory. If one manages to stay in the middle of these extremes, you'll be showing positive qualities and virtues. One example would be fear. If you are scared of everything, then you will miss out on things in life because you allowed fear to control you. An example of cowardice. The quality or virtue that conquers fear and cowardice is courage. However, if one shows too much courage, we now lean heavily over to the other side of the spectrum, which is recklessness. Too much courage may leave you in situations that could have been easily avoided. Rather than the approach of this behaviour can only be good or bad, this is much more of a balancing act, trying to maintain a healthy mean, as opposed to the idea of sin and virtue. Anyway, moving on to the Christian, or more accurately, the Catholic concept of the seven deadly sins. The most concise definition I've come across is as immoral behaviour that would separate one from God and in turn lead to more sin being committed. A venial sin would weaken one's relationship with God, but not completely sever the bond as the deadly sins would. Turning your back on God was thought to make one more likely to commit what are known as mortal sins. If you then die without repenting for these mortal sins, you go straight to hell. So the seven deadly sins are essentially the gateway or temptation that leads to more sin. These ideas were first discussed in the Catholic Church by Pope Gregory I. He wrote about the seven deadly sins in the 6th century. 
A very similar idea was discussed several centuries before by the monk Evagrius, who instead listed eight evil thoughts. These thoughts were translated from Greek to Latin by John Cassian. Pope Gregory then streamlined this number to seven sins in his text Moralia, and thus we have the seven deadly sins. Gregory's list was then used again in the 13th century by Thomas Aquinas, who further expanded upon the ideas behind these sins. The first sin is pride, which is also commonly referred to as the father of all sin. Pride, however, in this case refers to ego or the idea of hubris, which is prevalent in Greek and Roman myth as one of the worst crimes one could commit. Whenever someone believed they were equal or greater than the gods, they were swiftly punished and made an example of. Once one succumbs to pride, this symbolizes a lack of humility. The welfare of others is ignored in place of their own urges and desires. This selfishness only leads to contempt and other sin. The most classic example we have of pride is Lucifer, the most beautiful of God's angels. Lucifer began to question everything about the universe he had been told. Eventually, he started to believe he could do a better job ruling heaven than God himself. This led to a great war in heaven that Lucifer would ultimately lose. For his rebellion, he was cast from heaven and forever known as the fallen angel who would embody the sin of pride. The opposite of pride is the virtue of humility, or humbleness. The next sin is gluttony. This is the act of overindulgence to the point of waste. Although gluttony is most commonly associated with the consumption of food, it can also refer to an overindulgent lifestyle, not too dissimilar from greed. There are several different types of gluttony. Thomas Aquinas divided gluttony into several forms. Eating food that was too expensive, luxurious, or exotic. Eating food in excessive quantities. Eating food that required elaborate preparation. Eating food at an inappropriate time. And lastly, eating food too eagerly. The virtue of gluttony is temperance or moderation. Exercising restraint and modesty are examples of how not to succumb to gluttony. Moving on to greed, or avarice as it's also known, this sin focuses on desire. The uncontrollable desire for material, social, and political gain. From this stems all sorts of questionable behavior. Hoarding riches and materials that could be used to help those in need. Stealing in order to obtain what you desire. Or lies, trickery, and the manipulation of others in order to achieve status or political power. Early European theologists would go as far to say, Other than the devil, there is no greater enemy to man than the desire for money. This was commonly used when discussing usury which is the practice of making unethical loans which exceed the legal interest rates, often taking advantage of others' misfortunes. This is what we would refer to today as a loan shark. Similar to pride, greed is considered a gateway into numerous other sins, as well as the root of many evils. Lust is the capital sin that relates to desire of a sexual nature. This was seen as leading to fornication, adultery, sexual assault, seduction, and bestiality in some odd cases. Most religions will distinguish lust from passion. Lust was considered an immoral desire, whereas passion was more widely accepted as God-given and the main driving force behind reproduction. Lust does also come in some other forms, such as the unbridled desire for money, power, and even food. These are minor forms of lust that relate to gluttony and greed. The virtue of lust is chastity, the act of refraining from sexual activity that may be considered immoral, or in some cases, from all sexual activity. Envy is a sin that ties closely together with both greed and lust. It is a desire for what others have that leads to resentfulness and sadness. This can mean desiring someone's possessions, achievements, physical and personality traits, or social status. 
In some cases, you may not desire them, but instead wish that someone else did not have them. Envy is also separated into two categories, malicious envy and benign envy. Malicious envy is similar to jealousy, the negative emotion towards people you perceive as better off than yourself. Benign envy is merely the recognition that someone is better off or in a better position than yourself. This type of envy is still negative, but it can be used in a positive way, such as the motivation to emulate someone's success. Malicious envy only leads down the path of hatred, isolation, and sorrow. The only sin that weighs down the soul more than envy is pride. The most famous example of envy, at least in the book of Genesis, is Cain murdering his brother Abel, because he was jealous God favoured his brother's sacrifice over his. The virtue of envy is kindness, which involves compassion and the satisfaction of one's situation or position. Sloth is a sin where we start to see the separation from God we mentioned earlier. This isn't laziness in terms of sitting around on the couch all day. Well, actually it is, but it also means a spiritual laziness. The Latin for sloth translates to mean without a care, not caring about anything in your current life and even the afterlife. Whatever the church perceived as obligations and duties would be ignored. Losing interest in hobbies, friends, work and romance was seen to lead to sadness and depression. All the sins so far have been something you should not do, an act you should not commit, but do anyway. Sloth, however, is the sin of omission, failing to do something you should. You may have heard of the phrases, the devil makes work for idle hands, or evil exists when good people fail to act. These are taken from a much older sentiment relating to sloth. The virtue of sloth is diligence and a persistent work ethic. The lack of stimulation relating to one's mind and body is still something many struggle to overcome even today. The only sin left to cover now is wrath, the feeling of rage and anger that one struggles to control. From wrath stems hatred and vengeance that causes feuds which can last for decades and even centuries. Anger was not considered a sin unless it was directed towards an innocent person. Only then does it become the sin of wrath. Anger is normally divided into three subsections. Passive anger consists of defeatism, self-blame, and apathy. This was seen as the path that leads to substance abuse and addiction. Aggressive anger consists of bullying, hurtfulness, and vengeance. Assertive anger involves calling out behaviour you deem as wrong, blaming the individual responsible for that behaviour, and then punishing them. The virtue of wrath is patience, allowing people time to change the way they behave. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video on the 7 deadly sins. I'm sure the comment section will be full of anime references I don't understand, and that's okay. Maybe it's something I'll cover in the future. As always, I've been your host, Mythology and Fiction Explained.